Good morning. Good morning. Nice and loud. Greg would be happy if he wasn't sick. He told me I, I was too quiet last time. <laughs> so I'll try to speak up, and I think the soundboard has got, got me on a uh, little, little, running a little hotter this morning. Okay, so as you all know, many of you know, I am a teacher. That's my full-time job, and I'm specifically teaching world literature and U.S. government uh, this semester, and so I'm an ELA, English language arts teacher. So I'm going to start this off with some vocab focus. It's a department goal this year to increase our students' vocabulary. So I've got some zingers for you. And I'm going to be super impressed if, like Jen, you even know one of these. You guys can guess which one she knew later. I was very impressed. I was trying to pick ones. I picked ones I didn't know. Okay. So first of all, let's look. There's four words that we're going to go over this morning. And they won't. It's just an icebreaker. They won't matter later except for one of them. But here's the first one. I'll pronounce it for you because I looked it up ahead of time. Crepuscular. Crepuscular. Anybody know what that means? Just guess out loud. Wrong answers are, are welcome. Heart muscle. Heart muscle. Yeah. Muscular. Crepu yeah. Crepuscular. Of or having to do with twilight. So different from diurnal or nocturnal. Crepuscular. Like, you know how deer like to, before the twilight, you know, they move around. If you're a hunter, right, you're going to look for the crepuscular animal right before they go to bed. All right. Next one. Petrichor. Petrichor. Anybody know that one? Close. Yeah, this was the one Jen knew. Um, the fresh smell that comes from rain coming in contact with the earth. You know that that smell. That's petrichor. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, that that's why it sounded familiar. Yeah. Okay. And last, uh, skeuomorph. Last one. Skew or third one, I should say. Skeuomorph. All right. Oh, so we know some root words. That's very good. Oh, having to do with a view. Okay, so a, a skeuomorph is something that looks like what it emulates, like, you know, the trash bin as an icon on your desktop. That's a skeuomorph. Yeah. <laughs> skeuomorphic, it would be a descriptive, yeah. yeah it's a skeuomorphic image, yep. Skeuomorph. Okay, and the fourth one, love. <laughs> There's lots of passages in God's Word about that, yeah. How would you define it? How do you define love? Some of us who've come up in church, maybe we, we would like to make an attempt. Um, I grew up in the church, pastor's kid. Uh, that's an awesome opportunity that I've had. But as I wrestle with the concept of love, I feel that I and my humanity don't understand it. And it does need to be defined and redefined and studied because it's beyond my human capacity. It's beyond my understanding. Which brings us to our passage this morning. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. We're going to read the, uh, a large chunk of this, but I want to start out with verse 16. It says, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. God is love. So what is love? Love is God. God is love. So to understand love, we must understand and know God. Uh, how can we know God through his word? So if you'll bear with me as I attempt to deliver this message that God has laid on my heart this morning... I want to understand God more, and I want to understand His love. So let's pray. Father God, um, it is really, really, really a big challenge not to understand or have access to Your Word, but to muscle through our humanity, Lord, as it gets in the way, as we're going to look at a little bit in this, in this attempt to teach Your Word this morning, that... We like to take your things and the things that are of you and change them, mold them in our image, and to pull them away from what you would have for us to understand. So as we seek to gain an understanding of God's love this morning, please guide us and guide our hearts. Amen. So the author of uh, 1 John is, we don't know. 
perhaps it's the same author as St. John, the book of John. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, biblical scholars like to wrestle with the authorship of the books of the Bible, and some are very clear and plain. But First John, uh, we don't have an author listed, but Second and Third John, it's he's referred to as the Elder. Okay, and so it's a safe assumption that we can at least refer to the author of First John as the Elder. And there's some themes that run throughout this first book uh, of John, for John one, and the first is that. The author wrote the epistle so that the joy of his audience would be full, that's in 1 John 4, that they would not practice sin, 2 John, uh, 1 John chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and that they would not be deceived by false teachers. And I want you to kind of let that one sit in your mind a little bit as we move through this lesson today. Not be deceived by false teachers, that's at the end of the second chapter. And that you who believe in the name of the Son of God may continue to know that you have eternal life, because that was some of the reason this book was written, because there was people wrestling with assurance of salvation, can we know? And that was in chapter 5. However, the Gospel of John was written for unbelievers, and it has an important story that we're going to couch on a little bit later. But these are written that in uh, John 20, 31, it says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Almost all the content of First John, written by John the Elder, um, is found in the book of St. John. It's an exposition and expounding. It's a sermon on John found in First John. It's this in contrast to the gospel written to believers, we will unpack the concept this morning of God being love incarnate. So if you want to follow along with me, I'll be reading from 1 John 4, uh, and we're going to read verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us one another, let us love one another, for God, for love is from God, and whosoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 8. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. That sounds very familiar. If it's a sermon on St. John, we know that verse, and we'll get there. We're going to go back there. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the replacement the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By the we, this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he, is, uh, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I love you. These three small words, they evoke uh, an emotional response. It doesn't matter if you've been in the church or not, or just being in culture, you, you have a concept of love. Love means something. Um, maybe I love ice cream. I love it. So uh, one of my students came up the other day and she said, look, look what I did. She got on the basketball team. She's from uh, she's from Japan. She's very excited to you know have that connection with our student body to play basketball with us. She brings it. It's the game winning shot. So I said there that yesterday actually, or not yesterday, but Wednesday, the last day of school. I loved it when you showed me that video of you making the game winning shot. I'm so proud of you. Right? We love things. Right? I love my teacher. Sometimes I love my mom. I love you, sweetie pie. 
Some of us love things like surfing, right, Steve? We hear the word constantly. It's thrown around so much, I feel like maybe it's been watered down. Reflect the first time you heard the words in your life. Maybe you have the benefit of parents who said it to you. Hopefully it was a biblical model of love that they were showing you, right? Maybe you've been without love in your life, and when I say the word love, it maybe triggers negative emotion. Some of us have that. Well, I'm here to tell you that you are loved, and this love is not a worldly cute love that we ascribe to romance and our favorite things. God is love, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. From creation to the coming of the Christ child as we enter into this season of reflecting on the most beautiful love story of Jesus uh, Jesus coming to earth, God sending his son to be a replacement for our sin. Jesus humbled himself to the cross. We see an earth-shattering pattern of eternal God and his love for us, his creation. We've been deceived, I think. Love is not simple. It's not of man. It's not something that we can understand without God in our heart and in our lives. A glance at the story of creation reminds us that God loves us. Genesis 1, 27 and 28 says, God created man in his own image. In God's image, he created him. If I had my son here, I could ask him his catechism. What is the image of God in man? What is God's image? It's the characteristics that God imbues within us that are of Him and only from Him. God being love, us created in God's image, then we have access to God. We have the ability to express godly love as long as we don't, in our humanity, corrupt it and pull it away from God's design. It's easy to get caught up in an identity crisis. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we frown at our reflection. I'm starting to frown a little more. You get a little older, you know. The hairline starts going. (laughs) But we forget to, or sometimes refuse to love ourselves as, as God loves us, and therefore love others, and view them the way that God views them. If we dig further in the Bible, we'll see, eventually come to this passage in 1 John, that God is love. We are connected due to His creation. Um... I had the privilege of driving a school bus out to Waianae every single afternoon for like three years. It was one of the ways that we made sure that we could, uh, it is expensive here, right? One of the ways we made sure we could feed our children, you know, when Jen was home with the with the littles. And uh, I had a girl that would ride beside me in the front seat sometime, and we'd talk about the things of God. I stay in contact with her, with her actually as I prepared this sermon this weekend. I sent her a message. I said, Tiffany, I remember our conversation. And I want to remind you, God loves you. Because when I said that to her, she jerked her head around to me. She'd been in a Christian school at Hanalani, and we're a Christian school the Bible's way. We teach the kids the Bible, right? She knows. She's heard those words. She knows John 3.16 that we're going to get into. And she jerked her head around to me. She says, I have such a hard time with that. I, I know what I've done. I know who I am. I know the thoughts I have. I don't believe that God loves me unconditionally. And thankfully, you know, the testimony is that she does believe that now and she does know God the Bible's way and she does, she does accept God's love. She, she messaged me a a, a few months back and says, so I'm in my science class. You can imagine what my professor's saying. I'm so happy that I had my experience at Hanalani to know God and to know his love. But we have a problem. If we, if we really search our hearts and we hear the words, I love you unconditionally no matter what, and it's not about me, that's tough. I was raised in the church. I, I know the Bible verses about love by heart, the ones that are popping into your mind as, as, we, as we go through this sermon this morning. But I have a hard time with it. Reading through these passages and reflecting on God's love for me and that while I was a sinner, he died for me. Listening to the songs this morning, thank you music team for for leading us into a time of worship. I wrestle with it. I wrestle with it a lot. How can God love me, a sinner? It's beyond me. It's not about me. There's another story I want to share with you. 
this one, I think we're we're maybe we're maybe there already. Maybe you accidentally flipped there when I said the word love. John chapter three. <clears throat> now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and he said, notice it was at night, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God was not with him. So he's a Pharisee. This is a ruling class that have rejected Christ as a group. We don't, we don't accept the lordship that he is, he is God's uh, son sent. We, don't, we, we reject him as a person. And so that's probably why Nicodemus came at night, came secretly, came with questions, came with his heart not understanding just as Tiffany and just as me and some of us don't understand who is Christ, what is his love. So he came to him and Jesus replied, Verily, truly, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So then Nicodemus asked, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, surely they can't enter into the womb a second time. I don't know, I think maybe Nicodemus being a wise rabbi probably knew that this wasn't really what Jesus was talking about. We have to read between the lines a little bit. Maybe this is discourse, right? Maybe his emotional response, that emotional response I have when I hear that God unconditionally loves me, a sinner in need of Savior, Maybe it's just scoffing, a reaction, right? We see Nicodemus reacting. Jesus answered, Verily, truly, I say, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? How can it be? You are Israel's teacher, Jesus says. You're a, you're a rabbi, right? You're a Pharisee. You're in this position of power. And you do not understand these things? Verily, truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe then how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? This is beyond you. This isn't something that you can understand in your own power. This is something that comes from me, God, Jesus. No one has ever gone into heaven except by the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, that whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But the people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So I want to refer us back, I want to break down. If you're looking for points, if you're taking notes, I have some, some notes here, four points for you. First of all, um, back to 1 John chapter 4. Love is a gift. Love is a gift. In the same way our salvation is not something we can earn, it is grace given. The love of God is unconditional and without merit. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. It's not God loved you so much that he gave you his son. It's because God is love. Because 
God is love. He gave his son to be a replacement for your sin. His very nature is unconditional love in that while we were still sinners, he gave his only begotten son. He humbled himself to an earthly cross. And this one's really, I think, what Nicodemus was wrestling with and what some of us wrestle with and what Tiffany wrestled with. There is no fear in love. The fear that perfect love casts out is the fear of God's judgment. We know that judgment day is coming, but those who are in Christ know the love of God, which drives away our fear of condemnation. It should clear it away as we revel in the reality of God's love. The dismissal of the fear of judgment is one of the main functions of God's love, among many others. The person without Christ is under judgment and has plenty to fear, as we read in uh, John 3, verse 18. John 3, 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But once a person is in Christ, the fear of judgment is gone. And Nicodemus' fear, though we don't have a record anywhere in, in St. John of Nicodemus coming into a relationship with Christ, it was on offer to him. We see him wanting to have a close connection to Christ, even when Jesus was, uh, when they were calling to, to crucify the Christ, right? Nicodemus says, let's put him on trial. Hold on, hold on. He didn't tell them, I went and talked to this guy, right, for fear of what would happen to him. But no, 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 let's put him on trial. And then when Joseph of Arimathea buried Christ, there was Nicodemus beside him helping. We see that the fear of judgment is gone, and if he would have accepted the love of Christ, that that fear could have dissipated. And so I reflect on my life. Am I ruled by fear and condemnation? Do I sometimes also do what Tiffany says is, I have a hard time with that. Jesus loves me no matter what? And not, not something I can do or earn? I can't wrap my head around that, to be honest. I struggle with it. It's brought me to tears so many times as I, as I read these passages. But I, in faith, I accept Christ's love and the gift of salvation that he gives to me. There is no condition, that's the third point, there's no condition for God's love. You can't earn it, and so you can't reject it either. You can't reject God's love, it's not up to you. You may reject a relationship with God, but God's love, God made you, you were created in His image, and He loves you unconditionally. That's also hard to wrap my head around. Okay, sure, I, I struggle with God's love for me sometimes. What about the murderer? What about the person that done me so wrong? Some of us have been done so wrong. How do, how do we love that person? We cannot in our humanity, in our own power. You can't. That's the answer. But it's through the acceptance of God's love into our life, the relationship with God, and then allowing God's love to flow through us. That's how we love the murderer, that person who's worked so hard to stop your success in life, the person that's supposed to love you that doesn't, that we harbor so much pain in our heart about. There's no condition for God's love. And last point, God's love gives us security. God's love is security for you, believer. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Children can memorize John 3.16. However, scholars and theologians regularly re still wrestle with it, its depth, trying to unpack that simple passage. Um, those of us in the middle that have been in church a lot still don't fully grasp it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten and uniquely born Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, Jen and I had a really funny encounter with a Greek man this summer. Um, not to do a, a 
movie recommendation, but there's a movie called My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and in it, uh, there's a grandpa that w- very, very quickly points out all of the Greek word origins for everything. So we were on a kayaking trip, and both the guides were Giannis, older Giannis and younger Giannis, and uh, we did a whole like 10K kayaking trip. It was awesome. It was fun. So they would get back, and I offered a... They're kind of uncomfortable with tipping like we are in America, so I was like, oh, maybe I'll buy them coffee. So yeah, they were fine. Uh, uh, the expression is siga, siga, slow, slow. That's the Greek way. So they had coffee with us and we're sitting there and about halfway through my conversation, older Giannis for the 14th time told me the Greek origin of the word that I used, vocabulary, right? And uh, yeah, younger Giannis goes, you're like that guy from that movie. <laughs> so I have a hard time looking at Greek uh, origins of words without that story popping up in my mind. So thanks for letting me share. But when we talk about uh, love, this is a classic, right? There are four forms of Greek love. Um, We'll talk about three of them today. Eros is love that is uh, not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. That's erotic love, love in the flesh, right? It's all about taking. It's all about getting something without giving in return. Erotic love is selfish. Eros is about self. Then there's the Phileo, which we all know is the root word for our city, Philadelphia. Brotherly love. That means a love that's between friends and family members. It's a give and take, a fraternal kind of love. But the love that is mentioned in our text is agape love. This love has nothing to do with the one being loved, just as I point out in John 3.16. It's all about the character of the lover. Agape love is not about the person being loved, because the person being loved may be totally unworthy of that love. It's a fatherly giving love. God is love. The love of God has nothing to do with the object of His love. The love of God is based on the character of who God is. Jesus Christ, through God the Father, loves us. He simply loves us. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Nothing we can do to deserve it. When we get up in the morning, He just loves us, even in the mundane things that we do. When we're doing things that we have no business doing, when we say things that do not honor Him, yet He loves us still, our attributes are not God's attributes. We're unforgiving lustful, greedy, hateful beings in need of the wages of sin, death. But God, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved and raised up with Him and seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might be show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 4-8. It makes no sense to my human brain. I can, accept, I can understand why my student looked at me with such pain and misunderstanding when I told her that God loves you unconditionally. Of course I don't deserve it. I was short with my children. I was greedy. I said words that didn't honor the God I serve. I was selfish. I allowed thoughts in my head that don't mirror the beautiful view God has of mankind. I can say the words, but why? God is love. No matter your station in life, the evil you have done, I can't love the abuser or the killer, those who harm children. My flesh rises up, actually. I'm not love, though. God is love. God loved the evil humans in our world so much that He sent His Son. That is overwhelming. That's incredible. My financial state, how much I work, how much I donate, the amount of time I spend doing good, it doesn't matter. God loves me. God loves me in spite of me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, famously called John 3.16 the gospel in miniature. It contains the whole of the message of the New Testament in those, this one short passage. God responds to the atheist, which claims that there's no God. God so loved. He states that He exists and He loves. For those that reject God's involvement in the world, the deist or the fatalist God, so loved the world that He gave His only Son as a replacement for the cost of our sin. He's acting right now 
in our hearts and the hearts of man. He offers mankind salvation by grace through faith. He responds to those who elevate country or membership above all else, for God so loved the world, everyone. It's not just for a certain creed or membership. There is an answer to materialism in it. He gave his son. What better gift? What better act of selfishness, selflessness to overcome selfishness? No act of generosity can match this love that God showed us. How can we arrange our priorities and give of ourselves? Try to match God the Father giving his very son. And last, there's an answer for those of us who would block people access to God. The legalists. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's for all of us, for each and every one of us. And I'm overwhelmed this morning with God's love. And as we enter into the holiday season of celebrating the birth of the Christ child, I hope that the incredible gift of God's love fills your life, challenges you, and be the love of God to others. Thank you.